Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 10 of Sideline Sports Podcast. We reach magic number 10. I am your host, Alex Nebeja, and alongside with me tonight is Jennifer Munoz. But before we get into the details on who Jennifer Munoz is, here's a little video from our sponsors from Lean Mean Meals. And that's a little video from our spot, our partnership with Lean Mean Meals. Make sure to use my promo code SIDELINE10. I'll make sure to put the, the website and the promo code down in the description <clears throat> below. But without further ado, let's get started. A little bit about Jennifer Munoz, our guest today. And you know what? Making a little history on Sideline Sports Podcast. You're the first pro athlete to come on to Sideline Sports Podcast. Do you know that? No. Well, there you have it. She knows now that you are the very first guest and first pro uh, athlete to come on Sideline Sports Podcast. So very nice to have you on the show, Jen. But I know a lot of you are wondering what what is so important about Jennifer Munoz. Well, she played in the, the National Guatemalan Women's Soccer Team. So, Jen, without further ado, tell us a little bit about that experience playing in the Guatemalan team. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here at your Sideline Sports Podcast. Can't wait to listen. Um, so, just to jump right into the national team. Um, so, all starting, uh, I was in, uh, no, where was I? I was a senior in college um, in a private university in Tennessee. Uh, we were top 10 ranked um, NAI schools in the whole country. So for me to get a full ride, um, I took it, you know, might as well, right? Full ride. Not a lot of athletes get that, you know? Right. Uh, especially in the female soccer in, in the industry. So. Um, so what happened was, just talking about my national team, how I got there. Um, I had a friend, um, he was my trainer, uh, he was a long time friend of mine, um, but unfortunately he passed away. Um, he oh man, sick. sorry to hear about and that. that was cool, but if it, if it weren't for him to push me and make the call, I would not be where I was. So I was on the phone, I remember I was talking to him, um, I forget, but he always motivated me to, you know, you're a good player, I believe, he believed in do it. Um, and honestly, I think you need to represent a country, <clears throat> which is, you know, obviously you're American, but, you know, you're also Guatemalan, and I think Guatemalan can be a good fit. You know, they need players that have that, I guess, physique, I guess, a foreigner uh, slash citizenship of Guatemala and so um, he gave me a phone number who to call and I was kind of like nah like I don't want to do it like nah, why oh, man. but he's like look if you don't do it this is not going to give you an opportunity to go pro and play in different clubs around the country trust me it doesn't even matter you know a national team is a national team um, but I think this is the only chance that would be best for you in your future. So this was like four years ago, I believe. Almost three years, four, three and a half years ago. And I was like, okay. So I made the call and it 
took me a while to get a hold of few people. I was talking to four different people, and all of a sudden I was on the phone with the head coach of the national team at that time. And I kept in touch, I told my story, what I'm doing. He said, you know, if we can get you down here as soon as possible, we can bring you down in our training camp and see how you do. And I was like, okay, great, what do I need to do? Well, first, I need to get my citizenship, right? So I had to get my passport, I did that right away, it took like a few months. Um, then there was Christmas, uh, yeah, it was around December. I booked a flight to Guatemala and I told the manager, look, I'm going to be at this, this location, what I need to do to get a spot to see me. And he's like, perfect, we're actually training for the Olympic qualifiers next year. Um, and I was like, okay. So I went, I flew, I met with him, stayed there for two weeks. Um, I had family there, so it's very helpful. Um, I got to see family that I haven't seen in a while, and I was obviously, you know, trying out the whole time. And they liked what they saw, and I had my papers through, and I had one month to get everything done. Fortunately, I was ahead of myself. The papers went through. Uh, I was still in college. Next year, January, um, I had to go. I got called up. They called me up. I had my passport ready, everything going, so I went to Guatemala, we trained there for a week, then the following week we head to Texas, Houston, Texas, for the 2016 Olympic qualifier wow. of the Olympics, and that was my first debut, um, so I was there for two weeks, um, we competed against Trinidad, a uh, country called uh, Guyana, very small, and then of course Canada, and Canada was one of our toughest opponents. It's, you know, they're big, they're fit, everything. So I got to experience the play against them, the big stadium, the crowd, so that was my first debut for Guatemala, and then ever since that, um, people, like my friend said, people are start contacting. And I started getting contacts, you know, playing here and there. And so that's how I started. That's my story. Not a lot of people have, you know, stories that, you know, you have to, you know, put yourself there. And a lot of people just start when they're young, they go through academy. Um, fortunately, everything that I did, I had to do it through a risk and help from people. So that's. That's my Guatemalan story. <laughs> it sounded like Christmas came a little late, but I mean, yeah. it was pretty worth the, you know, getting Christmas a little later mm -hmm. for you to get that presence yeah. of being able to play for the Guatemalan team. So, <clears throat> what were those tryouts like when the coach uh, contacted you once you got to Guatemala and when you had to try out in front of him or her? Was it uh, him? him? Um, what did you? What were the tryouts? What did they consist of? So since in college we have routines, you know, I physically it was fine for me. I was fit. I was. I, I can compete. Um, it was more technical. Uh, outside the countries, I feel like it's very technical. Whereas the U.S., it, it's technical but they're they rely on you being super big and fit and which is good i think and you should definitely have that everywhere as well but the style they had everything organized you know we go through a stretching they would go through agility work um footwork then ball work and then we go through plays meaning like the style whatever the coach wants us to do, how he wants us to play. Um, we would actually train, um, I think when I went, we trained twice a day and sometimes three times a day. So, um, the first the first day was just adjusting, you know, meeting the new girls. 
um, the language, you know, I knew Spanish, but, you know, it's just different coming from U.S., always English, and then now you're training with just peer, you know, uh, managers that speak Spanish and nobody speaks English. Some players spoke English, so it was, the language wasn't the issue, it's just the style. Um, but other than that, I think uh, everything was well organized. Um, as soon as we got to the tournament in Texas, everything was all through FIFA. Um, you know, they had cameras, they had conference meeting, they had our hotel to stay, they had our buses, they had um, our food reserved, uh, they had every schedule, one we can use the facility to train. Everything was just all on time. And then when it was game day, same thing, everything's on time because, you know, they play the games on li uh, live. So you have to make sure you're on time for everything. So I think the most important thing is time, you know, making sure you're on time. Don't mm -hmm. be late. Don't be late. Set mm -hmm. everything. So, yeah. So how were you able to make that transition from, you know, you, you played in college, as you mentioned mm -hmm. before, and then now you're in the big stage. You're in, going through FIFA now, and now you said you're playing in Texas. Now you got, like, the world is watching you. Basically, I'm the first in my family to be this far. Not only in soccer, but in college. I'm the first one to graduate um, in my generation to university. Wow. Yeah, nobody else wow, has. That's, big, that's a big deal. Yeah, nobody else has a bachelor's degree. My family in Guatemala think I'm like a celebrity. They, not really, but they're always like happy to see me. They, they admire me. Like my uncles, they actually take care of me. Like as soon as I come, they protect me wherever I go. It's not only because of soccer, it's just the, the environment, the, the, uh, the crisis that goes on. I mean, I think everywhere there's crisis, but you know, in Guatemala, there's, there's areas where I can't wear certain things, you know, I can't wear, like, soccer shorts, I can't, because, you know, there's just bad people there, so, um, so when they saw me play, they're super excited, obviously friends and family back home, you know, they're happy for me and my family, um, I remember my first game, when I first started, my college coaches were watching, they're all proud of me. Um, I ended up being the starting 11, my first game. I, I was not, I was, I was actually excited to start off from the bench and get in, but, you know, whenever a coach makes his decisions, his decisions. I remember my phone was just, uh, like, I got a lot of notifications, um, a lot of social media, a lot of people said, sending me this, sending me a clip, what I did. I had a little controversy in one of my first debuts, and I was just like, what? And then the video that people were sharing, like, it was literally like, I don't know how many views was in there, like, 38k, I don't know. I don't know, I can be wrong. Wow. But, yeah, and it's just funny, now I kind of understand how, you know, all those big time athletes like football players like just speaking in general how how it feels when people talk about you on social media and this and that this and that and to me i i was just i didn't really care i just thought it was funny um i was just i felt my myself just doesn't at the end of the day you're just a normal person you know the only the only thing is um you're admired I guess because you're playing sport that has a bunch of people watching and that's what they see but then when it's all done as a player it's, it's like a normal life so I guess that's what I felt like my people reacted which is they they admire me, but I, I still see myself as, um, you know, 
So were your whole entire family saying, oh, that's my mija, look right there, when they put the camera right on you, and they yeah. say, oh, Jennifer Munoz, you know, she's going to be a big-time defender. Were you playing defense already when you were with the, the no. team, or no, were you the midfielder? No, I, I was never a defender. I was actually always a forward. Always uh, a forward? Uh, okay. Outside forward, or a winger, um, or like an attacking mid sometimes. Mm -hmm. So when I got to my junior year of college, I that's when I started playing as a defender, so outside back. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like I like it, you know, it's, it's I get to see a lot like what's going on in, in the game. Same thing on the outside. Um, so at that time in Guatemala, um, I was playing as a winger. Um, so yeah, and then after that, I just been back and forth, outside back or winger. But you know, I didn't, I didn't have experience playing center back. I don't know what my coach was thinking, but I was a freshman. <laughs> and he put me back there, and I guess because I was quick, and it's, I guess because I knew what the attackers wanted, so I could read them. That's probably why, but. I don't like it, but you know, I do it. Just I knew what the coach tells me, right? So right. I just want to play. So, but yeah. So, when did it actually hit you that you're actually playing for the national team for Guatemala? Like, when did it actually just hit you and say, "Wow, I'm actually playing for for my my own land, my own." First day, first day of training. Um, yeah, I would say the first day of training when I was trying out. But when I finally got the call up to go back and train to prepare for Olympics, I think that's where I felt like this is what I want to do. Like this is how it feels like. Now I think because now I'm 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 there, I'm on their list. Whereas in the beginning it was more I want to feel like I'm there so I can make the team. It's a different type of feeling, you know. First time, I was like, okay, this is what it feels like. Um, do I want it? And then I wanted it. And now I'm on the list, and that's when it felt like, okay, I'm finally representing the country. This is what I have to give 100%. And it's not only representing me, it's re representing the country, it's re representing my family, where it came from. So um, my dad was very happy. He, he said, you know, I'm very happy with what you're doing. I never thought my daughter would represent my country. And I was like, well, now I'm here, so, but yeah. Well, guys, we're going to go ahead and take our break here in, in, in the sideline sports podcast but when we come back we will have a little bit more about jen and her her childhood days and what made her choose soccer out of all of the other sports but don't go away guys it's just gonna get better here for sideline sports podcast episode 10 we'll be right back hi my name is jennifer munoz and i play for the Guatemala women's national team and you're here watching sideline sports podcast Welcome back to Sideline Sports Podcast, Episode 10 Special, The Gen Edition, presented by Lean Mean Meals. But before we took that commercial break, we were talking a little bit about the, fam the family members that were very proud of you. So, which family member did it hit you the most that was the most proud of you, and why? Mm. I have to say it too, but one is, I'm going to go with the first one, my dad, um, he was a soccer player too, so for him, um, he, his family background, they're sports people, but they never made it as far. If they did, it was probably like a great grandpa not sure that's that's a different story but 
Um, it would be my dad because he's a soccer guy. And the second one would be my older brother because he told me this that, you know, what you have is what I put him at. Um, but I messed up. That's what he said. Um, my older brother, I actually looked up to him. He was actually going through pro contracts and trials. Um, but, you know, things in his life, he, the choices he made, um, he just thought those were better and gave away his soccer dream. Um, so he always told me, you know, you have a chance to get out the house, do it. Doesn't matter. And I think that's that's what made me do the things that I, that I did. Um, but yeah, I would say my older brother because I thought he was going to go far. He was close to making it far, but he did it. Instead, it's me. So it's kind of the other way around. He looks up to me now, so it's kind of, it's kind of sad, but happy at the same time for me and him. So. Mm -hmm. So you're basically just representing for you're not just your family but your brother as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, family is always everything. So you know they're always gonna be the people that would be there for you. You know you can have best friend that's good. Your best friend can be there for you, but I see it. You know at the end of the day, your family is gonna be there with you when you're very sick or, you know, this and that. So right. that's just how I think. So Right. So let's talk a little bit about your college days. You started off in a Golden West College first and then you were able to transfer over. Yeah, so Golden West, how did I end up there? Um it was a club coach of mine. He was helping out at that college at that time. Um, I somehow got a hold of the college coach. And I told him, hey, um, I'm a senior. I'm looking to play college soccer and judo just because I'm, I wasn't ready for four year. I didn't have... I didn't have my SAT, so I was very, I was late, um, and that, that, at that time, I was in, I was in a stage where I didn't know what I wanted, so, I was like, okay, well, right now, what I want is spend less money, right, so, a JUCO, get two years out of the way, and transfer, okay, I wasn't really thinking about playing soccer, but I wanted to play a sport in college to, you know, help with stuff. Um, so I went there, I was a freshman, um, did well. Um, my second season, um, I was more of an attacker, um, that's what I knew. And I became one of the good players in the conference. My senior year, I that's where, not my senior year, sorry, my sophomore year at Golden West. Um, I, that's a year where I really worked hard as an athlete to transfer and play a four year. And so what happened was I went to a, a camp at Cal Poly Pomona. I actually wanted to go to school there just to study, but you know, I felt like I was ready to play and a four year, just transferred. I had the credits, everything. Um, so I went to their ID camp, and the coaches, there's probably about 50 year olds, I don't know. That's yeah. a big squad. Some of them were sophomores, some of them were uh, freshmen, some of them were high school seniors, okay? So everybody's trying to get a spot, you know, for Cal Poly Pomona. What I didn't know is while we we're all in tried out, we we're playing, at the end, 
they're like how Polly Pomona poaches they come up to us and they're like, Look, unfortunately our spot is full. But we have other polish poachers that we're watching. Oh, whoa. Yes, okay. to give us opportunity. And so we're like, okay. And then we had like another scrimmage at the end. After that, two of the cow poly Pomona poachers came up to me and they're like, look, you're right now, you're one of the players that are standing out right now. And it just sucks wow. because we don't have room, and if we do, it's just it's not going to give you much scholarship. And, you know, and to go here, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. But we have this coach that really wants you, and they're one of the top eight in the country, private school, and he wants to talk to you. And I was like, okay, sure, uh, I'll talk to him after I'm stretching. And we had a stretch. No joke, they didn't even let me stretch. They they're like, no, he wants to talk to you now. And I'm like, okay. And I will never forget how this coach came up to me. Um, he literally, his face was super close to my face. Like, he was, if he listens to this, he, he'll, he knows the story. I felt like he was talking to my soul, like, he, he was one of those guys that just stares at you, like, you know, he, he knows what he wants, and his style of play was kind of similar to how I, I played, from what he said, he said, look, you're the only girl that I want, I'll, I'll tell you right now, you're going to be taken care of if you come with me. And when someone says that to me, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Like, I didn't believe him. It took me a couple of days to reach back to him. So it was, it was, he, he was really messaging me, hey, like, what do you think? Hey, this is what we're giving you. What, 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 what do you want? And so I had other, another college coach in Kansas that wanted me as well. He actually... He actually, the Cal Poly Pomona coaches actually gave him my info from Kansas. So Kansas called me. And I'm like, okay, well, Kansas was willing to pay me the second highest player. So I'm like, okay, it's not too bad, you know? The other college was, no, I'm giving you a pull right here. And trust me, I'm going to help you be what you want to be. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, you know what? Tennessee, never been there, never been at Kansas either. They're both in the countryside. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to the countryside. Um, I took Tennessee. Um, I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. You're giving me a full ride. I went for a visit, you know, small little college, small town, but the people are very welcoming. Um, everybody's a, foreign, a foreigner there. You know, you have players coming from Costa Rica, Brazil, Scotland, England, um, uh, I don't know, other countries. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I like that. I like mixing it up and having different style players. So, and that's, that's where I ended up. And my junior year, did well. I was playing as an outside back, sometimes a winger. Um, it was it was a good. Um, uh, how, sh how should I say? It? it was it was a good experience. First year. First year is always you're adjusting, you know. And then second year, I was like, all right, it's on. You have to figure and it out. He even told me next year, we're putting you winger. You know, you're in the you'd be free. So, you were talking a little bit about earlier how there were players of, um, that were f coming from different places. You are talking about Brazil, you are talking about um, different spots. I had a two-part question. How, how did you make the transition um, from, you know, being from California to Tennessee? And then how did you make, how were you able to, like, adapt with, like, your new teammates? So, transition to Tennessee. Like how the cultures. 
Yeah, yeah, adapting the culture going from California to Tennessee. Like, how did you, how were you able to, you know, just like adapt to that, to a new life like that and adapting to a new, like, new team? So, from Cali Girl to Countryside, totally different. My roommate, she's, she, she knows, she is Country Girl. She's from Tennessee. She got a little accent in there. And I'm a Cali girl that likes the beach laying down. I still, even, because Tennessee is very hot and humid. That, that's what took me a while, is the weather. I couldn't adjust right away with the weather. The humidity and the heat is just, it affects you. You know, I even though I trained hard in California and then go to the Tennessee weather, it's, you're still in a struggle a bit. You just gotta keep, you know, playing out there. So it took me a while. So that was probably one of the hardest. Just us California weather, you know. We're a little spoiled with the weather. Hmm. You know, we want a 70 degree weather, we're good. And Tennessee is like 90 and humid and muggy, and, you know. Um, so that was hard. Um, I would say the players. Well, some players actually didn't know any English, whereas oh. myself, I know English and Spanish, some of them only know, for example, Portuguese, they only speak Portuguese, um, Spanish speakers, same thing, only Spanish, um, so it was pretty cool, like, for me, because I can help them translate, you know, from English to Spanish, um, but as a team, when the coach is speaking, we had players that were there more than a year that catch the language, the language which is you know English. So right. we had we had players translate for, for the new players. So um, the language wasn't really the issue. It's just as long as you can see what we're doing, you're fine. So. But other than that, I think I, I just am fine with the players because, you know, I knew two languages, so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I see you're doing a little of that beach soccer action, too. You're yeah. getting really into that. Oh, beach soccer, that's a whole different thing. So, how did I start? So, beach soccer happened after I was done with college. Okay. Yeah, so after I graduated, I actually didn't go home that following summer when I graduated. I actually played in Indiana. It's a semi-pro team. Um, so I was there for three months. Um, and that Indiana team is actually what led me to Puerto Rico. So that's, a Ooh, okay. so that's another story. So I got home. And I actually been talking to a friend of mine, uh, his name is Brian Easler. Um, I've been talking to him um, since I was in college, and he's from here. He was from here in Long Beach, California. And I was like, who is this guy? Like, you know, beach soccer, okay. Just, I ran the beach before, like, I, I know what this is. As soon as I got there, he started training me, and I'm like, what, what, what's this for? Like, what am I doing? He's like, a new sport. So he's teaching me what beach soccer is. I worked out in the beach, you know, I did a little training session with the ball before, but not like the style. The style is different, you know, you gotta keep the ball in the air. You gotta have great touch. You gotta have good juggling skills. Then he had, he had me, you know, throwing bicycle kicks because, you know, that's a big thing in beach soccer um so i was just training for three months and that following year um there's a first tournament here in long beach and i was like okay i'll, I'll play and he put me into some yes team I didn't know any girls I'm like okay and i was actually training like and 
since these girls just play, just play, and I'm competitive, like, I want to win. Right. And so we're in the bracket, and we started winning every game, and I remember I was playing in the back. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, in beach soccer, I'm considered a defender, and, uh, outside mm, midfield. Okay. The, the formation is different, I'll explain. So, you're only allowed to have five players on the field, okay? You have no keeper and four players playing, so you have to keep moving around. So, we got to the finals, and we're playing a team that actually, like, trains. Uh, they're, right. they're up in Northern California, you know? I, I became friends with some of them. Um, and still today they're, they're, they're competing and they're probably the toughest team we played because uh, they're very physical but they even came up to me like if it weren't for you on that team you guys wouldn't have won. Oh, I was like, well, thank crazy. you. So how long have you been playing beach soccer? I was like, well, less than three months. They're like, what? So yeah, we won the whole tournament and then after that I started training. My friend Ryan, we were training a lot. He had connections to go uh, play in different countries, just tournaments. And then I went to, I ended up going to Trinidad Tobago. Um, and that next following year, I ended up going to one of the biggest tournaments in beach soccer, where all wow. the pro athletes, the men's side and female side. The female side, it's, it, it was growing, like, back in the day. Now it's actually big. Like, it's one of the bigger yeah, ones. Yeah, here in America, it's still, you know, but outside the country, it's, there's girls that can just throw bikes like nothing. So it's pretty cool. So I went to Portugal. I played in the tournament called the Euros Winners Cup. I was playing with the Holland team. Um, so I was there, then uh, I played other tournaments here in the U.S. We had a big one here in San Diego, uh, mm -hmm. Oceanside, uh, a lot of pro men's side punk, uh, foreigners, um, and then I just got back playing in Costa Rica a few weeks ago, um, so that was fun. And then now we got a new tournament this December in San Diego. You guys should go. Um, so that's going to be another one. But other than that, beach soccer has helped me a lot in, you know, regular soccer. You know, works on your, obviously, your fitness, your touches. So, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I'm still playing beach soccer. I, I want to keep growing as a player in that, so... So, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer regular soccer or do you like beach soccer better? Uh, I can't really say that. Um, Tough decision? Am I putting you too much on the spot? So, I grew up playing regular soccer. It's what I do. Um, I would say regular soccer, but the only reason why is because it's constant. So both sides of the team, uh, sports, regular soccer and beach soccer, and the female, female side, um, there's not much money invested. So there's more money invested in regular soccer than female. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, since I live in the U.S., you know, it's the lifestyle is different compared to players in Brazil, you know, we got girls from Brazil that are playing in these tournaments, I don't know how they do it, but they're always constantly playing, even in Europe, so that's the only reason why I would say regular soccer for me, just because I, I that's, that's what I grew up doing, mm -hmm. but the cool thing about beach soccer is that, how should I say it, like, it's always going to be there, even when you're older and older, you know. Um, we got guys that are in their 50s and playing, like, it's, you know. Whereas regular soccer, yeah, you can play, but you're not going to play, like, in a high level when you're, like, 
older. You get what I'm saying? Right. Whereas beach soccer, you're still playing the high high level. Yes, you're running on sand. It's harder. But this is just the way I see it. You know, people can think differently. But I feel like I'm going to keep playing beach soccer when I'm older. Right. And, you know, I think I can still do it. I have, I, you know, a lot of players have the ability to keep going. And when people say that, well, isn't beach soccer super hard and you're running on sand? Yes, it is. But it's all about moving the ball, keeping the ball near your touches, you know. It's, it's, it's fun. Like, it's just, you just got to watch a beach soccer game and you'll, you'll, you'll understand what, what I'm saying, so. Mm -hmm. So, you've been through so much, you've, you've, you just, I, I'm just lost for words right now for so many things and so many trials that you've been through. What has truly been your motivation and your inspir your inspiration in soccer? My motivation, something that I hear other players say it, which I can agree, is getting away from the real life. You know, the real normal life, like working you know, eight hours a day and all that. Whereas I saw it as I rather put a lot of hours in something that I can travel and do what I love to do. Um, do what I, my body can do. And soccer is, my sport is what makes me want to do that. Um, what motivated me was that, you know, getting away from, you know, the normal boring life. But obviously, you always have to have a plan B. And I, I get told this so many times since I was young. And that's why I finished school first. Because a lot of players don't go to school, they go straight to play pro, especially in the men's side. But what if you get hurt, you know, the same story. What if you get hurt, um, what are you going to do with your life? You know, I always get that question, what are you going to do with your life? Even my mentors say that, you know, and all of them are very helpful, even though I can be in the pain of the butt, you know. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm stubborn at times, uh, they know that, um, but it's... It's because I, I want to do what I love to do and not let people have that chance to play and play overseas and, you know, get right. paid, you know. Yeah, it's not much money, but, you know, we're, we're living okay. Like, we're enjoying our time. So, I think that's why a lot of players do that. Um, Right now, I I was going to go play in Puerto Rico second season, but things came up, um, things that I'm trying to do um, just to better my future. Right. Um, so right now, since I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not old, you know, I'm 25, but, you know, I, do, I am thinking about my future, you know. I'm thinking ahead. I don't know. People say that's a good idea that you're doing that. Some say that nah, just live the present, you know. But I want to make sure in my future I have, I, I'm going to be okay. And what I'm doing, what I'm learning right now, being surrounded by successful people and, you know, in, in the business, what I'm doing, I'm learning a lot that I didn't have when, you know, I was in college. You know, they don't teach us this in college. And now I have the information, so now I, I'm, I know in the future I'm going to be okay. Um, even if I still play, continue to play soccer. Um, so that's why I didn't take the, you know, the offer this season. Um, some of my teammates left to go play second season. Um, you know, they, they, they have the reasons why, and I have my reasons why I'm here. 
Um, but yeah, right now I'm on a hold. You know, maybe you know something will come up. Um, we'll see. Maybe winter time. We'll see what happens. But honestly, at the end of the day, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, I'm I'm always preparing for something different. And the thing is, to be an athlete, you know, it's the same routine over and over, like like a job. You know, you go, you wake up in the morning, you know, you go to training, you go on the bus, you go to practice, then you go back, you go back home, you sleep, rest, okay, let's say it's game day, let's say you fly, you go on the plane, then you go to the bus, then you go to the hotel where you stay, you eat, then you gotta go train, after train, you go back to your hotel, and you eat, and you rest, and then you do the same thing over and over. And it's kind of like, you miss out a lot in life, actually. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate you letting me share my story, my soccer journey, so... Well, Jen, again, thank you so much for being with us on the episode. And you know what? For being with us on a very special episode for episode 10, the Jen edition, as I like to call it. But again, this episode of Sideline Sports Podcast was brought to you by Lean Mean Meals. You guys can get your meal prep done with them. They have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you guys every week. It's a new menu going on. So they got they also have your detox juices along with your cold brew coffee. So make sure you place your orders today. Use my promo code SIDELINE10 to save yourself 10% off on all of your orders. I'll put the link and the website down into the description. Again, thank you so much, Jen, for being with us on this episode of Sideline Sports, Sports Podcast. I am your host, Alex Neveka. We'll see you guys next week. There's still plenty to come on Sideline Sports Podcast. Make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up also, and guys, have a good night.